Hi there, welcome to Griffin Today. I'm Sarah Hatton. And I'm Ellis Cross. We've got a great set of stories for you today, including a sneak peek of ROTC on Western's campus and a look of menswear for women in the fashion segment. And I'm going to be interviewing the members of the Occupy St. Joseph movement. And now, from the art department, here's Entertaining Western with Sarah Waters. Welcome to another episode of Entertaining Western. I'm Sarah, and this is your guide to what's showing Western style. Film fans and drama devotees, we've got your front row seats. Art aficionados, song supporters, we'll show you where to feed that craving. Or maybe you just want to be entertained. Whoever you are and whatever your passion, we'll tell you where it's at on Entertaining Western. town, the St. Joseph Community Chorus is gearing up for their upcoming concert, The Beauty of Fall. The chorus has been performing in St. Joe for the last 50 years and is directed by Dr. David Benz, the director of choral activities here at Missouri Western. This concert, like so many before, is themed. The chorus has done concerts focused on everything from tributes to specific composers to commemorating historical events like the Holocaust. This concert features the spirituals of Norman Luboff. So if you'd like to hear some of the works of this influential composer, the concert will be on October 23rd at 3 p.m. in the Fulkerson Center. Tickets can be bought at the door or online at stjoechorus.org. check out the newest art show in the Potter Gallery. This month is featuring the work of Caleb Taylor in the form of paintings and drawings. Caleb is known for his vivid use of color and modern style. In fact, the work on your screen now is an example and is entitled Lean. The show is located in the Potter Hall Gallery and runs from October 17th through November 11th. The gallery is open from 8 a.m. until 5 p.m. daily. For more information about this artist and his works, or to purchase a piece, visit calebtaylorart.com. For the Moving Pictures fan, the foreign film series has another installment. This time, the series is visiting France with the film Serrano de Bergerac. The film is about a dashing officer and romantic poet by the name of Serrano de Bergerac, whose primary identifying feature is his rather spectacular sniffer. He's in love with a girl named Roxanne, but she has no idea because he's afraid she will reject him and his nose. He resorts to writing letters to her at the behest of one of his cadets, who's also in love with Roxanne. Chaos and confusion ensue as the web begins to unravel. Serrano de Bergerac is in French, but as per usual, subtitles will be provided. The film is rated PG and runs for 137 minutes. It's directed by Jean-Paul Rapineau and stars Gerard Depardieu, Anne Brochet, and Vincent Perez. As with the rest of the series, the movie will be showing in the Hearn Center, 107, and will begin at 6.30 p.m. For more information about the series, visit the English, Foreign Language, and Journalism Department website. Wrapping up this episode is the next monthly segment of the Downtown Noontime Concerts. This month, the choirs of Missouri Western will sing. Performing will be the Concert Chorale, Renaissance Singers, Women's Chorus, and Men's Chorus. The concert will begin at noon at First Presbyterian Church, and run between a half an hour and 45 minutes. The concert is free, but you can make a donation to support the continuation of the series. For more information about the concert, visit firstpres301.com. So bring your lunch and join us for a taste of Missouri Western's choirs. Hello, today in our studios we have with us Judd on my far left, Ron Runke in the middle, and Marcus. They are one of the uh, people that are involved with uh, the movement called Occupy St. Joseph. And we're going to get some establishing information for them today. First of all, and what is the agenda for this Occupy St. Joseph? 
I think um, <coughs> agenda might actually be kind of narrowing down what it is that we're trying to do a little too much. Uh, right now, we're trying to raise awareness about <coughs> certain issues that are really affecting a lot of Americans, uh, most Americans actually, and getting a discussion going is really kind of key to getting the ball rolling, not just here in St. Joe, but pretty much all across the nation. I would add to that that, that we're providing a focus for people to come and be able to express their thoughts, their opinions about what's going on in terms of Wall Street, the bailout, corporate takeover of our government. Uh, so there are, as Judd said, many issues at play here. At the end of the day, we're just <coughs> concerned citizens. Concerned citizens with... Right. This is an example of pure, beautiful democracy <laughs> in action. Okay. Uh, but but the, we, we have to discuss, because I personally, and I believe a lot of people do, we lump this Occupy St. Joseph with the same people who occupied New York in the park and did the bridge crossing and with all of the uh, arrests and things like that. Uh, are you a part of that group or what happened there? We're in solidarity with them. Uh, what that basically means is, you know, we're participating in the spirit of the movement, not so much they're leading it and we're following. It's, you know, we have a voice, they have a voice, Boston has a voice. I mean, we all have a voice and it's solidarity. We're just coming together as a group, as a whole, as a nation to discuss issues, especially some very strong issues with our employment, with the corporations, with the bailouts, our elections, politicians. I mean, just some fundamental issues of our nation that really need to be addressed at this point. I think some very brave and resolute individuals up in Wall Street decided to take it upon themselves to start a discussion <coughs> and by doing so they drew attention to themselves by placing themselves in an area where they were sure to grab the attention necessary to make this movement spread. I'm not sure at what point it really became a movement. Maybe it was before they had even had the notion to gather together. I think that this movement has kind of been something that's really been churning beneath the surface and it's really now starting to break through our social fabric. Wall Street was the really right place for this to begin because it was Wall Street who wrecked our economy. Mm -hmm. As we've learned over history, absolute power corrupts absolutely. Mm -hmm. And when you give an entity, whether it be one man as a tyrant or a corporation, they'll do whatever they can to survive and benefit themselves. And we've reached that point to where now they're benefiting themselves to the expense of everybody else. What Judd has <coughs> said is absolutely right. Our corporations have so much power that we're really headed toward a corporate state. And they're <coughs> buying our politicians and corporate lobbyists are our writing our legislation. So they've gotten so much power <coughs> that <coughs> they're destroying our democracy. I mean, even here in St. Joseph and our mm. communities around it, we've had how many factories live here? Uh, to go to a foreign country because free trade allows them to make more money in a foreign country than in the United States. So now we've laid off all of our middle class and they've all moved on to other jobs and now our, you know, the next generation, they're coming out of school, they're getting degrees and you know, their parents are working the jobs that you know, they should be starting at. But because of layoffs and um, aspects of free trade, those, you know, our parents have taken the jobs that were waiting for us when we graduated. We all have felt the impact of, of these kinds of issues. And up until now, I think on a very large scale, it's mostly been about taking it on yourself, trying to cope with it, find ways to deal with it. But it's getting to the point now where we might be rapidly approaching a breaking point, at least here in America. Um, and I welcome that breaking point because the sooner we've had enough, the sooner that we stand up, united as one, and solve the problem, the better. I think we agree though, it's, it, it's not gonna be any short-term fix. I mean, these are long-term problems. It's gonna take a long time to fix it. We agree with that one? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. you guys could agree with that. Yeah. I'm yeah. all for the solution, no matter how long it right. takes. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen, for being with us in the studios today. We really appreciate the insight to your group, and best of luck to you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. I guess my message to St. Joe would be this. If you are one of, if you are a citizen that has no savings account, has been laid off from one of the companies 
anywhere in the United States. If you are a student and you are under massive student debt, any of those people, you are part of the 99%. You have a voice and you can either be quiet or you can stand up and use your voice to enact some change in our government. And now for Megan Baggett's segment on ROTC in Missouri Western. On Thursday afternoons, the ROTC cadets meet in the lawn next to Wilson to participate in outdoor class. They arrive in full uniform and are issued supplies such as water and fake weapons before they fall out to have their class. Here is Sergeant First Class Grady Du Bois to explain their different activities. The basic tasks that they have to do when they're part of a, we call it infantry fire team. So, and so those tasks, we call them specialty training. Today, roughly about 75 cadets are training with our freshman and sophomore, it'll be around 45 to 50, and we have 20, we have 19 juniors, and the juniors will be in the leadership roles. What does it take to be a cadet? Any college student basically can take the sophomore and freshman level classes, that is the 100 and 200 level class in lab, to be in the advanced portion of the ROTC program. As a junior or senior, you will have to be contracted or on scholarship. Something you may not know is that several of the cadets are not from Western. They are from UMKC and Northwest. Western is the most central school, so the trainings are held here. Here is Jared Nicholson to explain the value of training and how it helps to be successful in life and as an officer. We teach our cadets to improve their skills um, in situational uh, awareness, uh, also the sticks maneuvers that they perform in these uh, training activities on Thursdays. It helps us as future officers to show our skills to them and to improve our skills later on in life. They're actually very useful into prepping us to kind of juggle our class schedule along with the, um, uh, I should say, how can I say this, authority that we have in this program. My job is the S5, which is the communications and media officer. Um, I go around and try to facilitate um, media to come and organize anything with the sticks that we do or our field training exercises that we do this coming up in October. Um, also, we do recruiting events. Uh, we just had one at UMKC. Uh, we also have another one coming up here at uh, Mo West and one in Northwest as well. Next, we have Ebony Lacey interviewing a freshman volleyball player who is actually starting as a libero. This is Ebony Lacey. I'm here with Griffin today. Um, we're here at, with Sarah Fobble. She is a freshman volleyball player, star athlete. So Sarah, how do you feel tonight? Um, I feel really good. It's uh, a great, great night tonight for our team and it's just great, so. <laughs> Awesome. So um, how do you feel as being a starting freshman? You know, you're still young, still learning, but you're playing, doing everything. Um, it's really nice. I mean, I definitely still have a lot to learn from the older girls and from my coaches and stuff, but it's such a great honor and I'm just going to take and use it and go with it and do the best that I can for my team. So how do you feel the season is going so far? I think the season's going really well so far for being in the beginning and everything and we see improvements already in our team and that's the main thing about a team is growing as the season progresses. So, okay. um, What is your favorite aspect about volleyball? What's the thing that you like to do best? Oh, oh gosh, that's tough because there's so many aspects that I love. Um, I would have to say probably digging libero but um, there's just so many parts of the game that's so exciting when someone gets a kill or a stuff block or an ace like there's so many parts that's why people love volleyball so how long have you been playing um I would say since second third grade a, a long time so and then how did you like start playing um I started playing oh gosh just from an elementary school and girls in my class were doing it but Ever since I've started, I've just loved it. It's definitely my favorite sport. <laughs> awesome. So what are you hoping to gain from the season? I'm just, as, as a freshman, I'm wanting to gain just a lot of experience for even next year and stuff. But, I mean, our team, I really think, is special this year, and we have a lot of great team chemistry. So just playing together and just having fun with the season. So. 
And how important do you feel team chemistry is in general? Um, I would definitely say team chemistry is the most important thing. If you if your team isn't uh, meshing or anything, you cannot accomplish anything. Any team goals are individual goals. So. All right, and this is Ebony Lacey with Sarah Fobble here. Uh, this is Griffin today. And now to Maximum Style with Robin Patty. Hey guys, Robin here with Maximum Style. Now that fall is here, we're going to start seeing those fall fashion trends walking around campus. One of those is the menswear inspired look on the ladies. Now this isn't anything new. This look actually dates back from years and years ago. So let's take a look at this long road that this style has had. The menswear look is a long-standing style that stems from the 1920s. Coco Chanel was the first designer to introduce men's clothing features into women's daily wear, which at the time featured corsets and floor-length gowns abiding by the hourglass figure. During World War I, women were forced to work, and Chanel responded to this new way of life by discarding the stuffy Victorian garb and opting for looser dresses more suitable for the workforce. The tweed suit was introduced in 1923 to create a fashionable look for the working woman. By the 30s, Chanel was a household name and her look was quite popular. When Amelia Earhart made her flight across the Atlantic, the shift was starting to be noted in America. In 1966, Yves Saint Laurent debuted his city trouser suit on the runway, intended to play the same role for women's wardrobes as it had for men. By 1970, trousers for women was a widely accepted notion and the world never looked back. Decades later, we still see this look hot off the runway every fall, and Chanel will never lose her style and grace as she dresses women in men's attire. All right, so as you can see, this look has come a long way from when Coco Chanel first debuted her tweed suit. We have Christine with us here today, and she's going to show us some key pieces so you yourself can add this look into your wardrobe today. Now, she's wearing a navy blue shrunken blazer. Now this is definitely a menswear trend, obviously the men's blazer, but it's, been, it's just been revamped and restyled. Um, as you can tell, it's a shrunken style, so it's got that shorter length here and a shorter sleeve length. Now they've added detail under the sleeve, so you can wear this rolled up or down if you wish, but with the rolled up you just add that little piece of color there. They've also added some trimming. We've got a satin trim here along the lapel and down along the front. And as you can see, this is shrunken, so it is a little bit smaller, but it is a stretch material, so it still adds that bit of comfort. Now to finish this look with the blazer and the skinny jeans, we have a spectator pump. Now this is just taken from a men's Oxford. You can see this detail here, adding that um, menswear look to it. But added to a Mary Jane, it definitely keeps that feminine style. So that was a formal version of the menswear trend. Let's take a look at a more casual version. Christine has on here the classic vest, but obviously done in a drapier style. It's been cropped in the back to add a little bit of feminine side to it. And it also has a fun print on the inside. Now the way Christine is wearing it, obviously is just a white t-shirt and some jeans. And we've added another Oxford, but this is a flat style to keep that casual look going. And it's got the detail with the pin dots on it to add a little bit of fun style as well. All right, so now you've seen the menswear trend in action. So until next time, this is Robin with Griffin Today. Bye. <laughs> and now Sarah Hatton has the inside scoop about what happens off the field with football players. Football players often have a reputation of being just jocks. But here at Missouri Western, Griffin football players are just like you and me. When their gas tanks are running on empty, they fill up. Grandma, you want the chairs over here? When there's a household chore that needs to be done, they handle it. That's good. They have to haul groceries into the house. And those groceries won't put themselves away. You're not putting them in the right place. The glass goes down. Anything that's in glass goes down on the bottom. And the cans can go on in the next shelf. Do you have racks in your brain? I told you I didn't go there. Sorry, Grandma. Just because they are star athletes on the field doesn't mean all they do is win. What have you got? Straight flush to the tin. Oh. Yeah. Take that, Grandma. Four kings. Eat it. They have to put in time to maintain a certain level of fitness. Griffin football players know the importance of staying hydrated. And of course, they need their beauty sleep too. Yeah. 
Griffin football players, just like you and me. Thanks to all of our special guests today, and thank you for tuning in. Be sure to check out Griffin today, every day, at griffinnews.com.